include silent studies, creative pedagogy, language and culture communication, and curriculum development. His recent books include Silence in English Language Pedagogy from Research to Practice, uh, published by uh, Cambridge University. Transforming Pedagogies to Engagement with Learners, Teachers, and Communities, uh, published by Springer to, uh, 2021, Creativity and Innovations in ELT Materials, uh, Looking Beyond the Current Design, uh, published by Multilingual Matters, uh, 2018, uh, poetry for Education Classroom Ideas uh, that Inspire Creative Thinking, uh, published by uh, Slibris, uh, 2017. Understanding Silence and Recenters, Ways of Participating in SLA, uh, published by Bloomsbury, 2014. Uh, in 2019, uh, Dr. Baudak received the Dean's Award for Excellence in Teaching at Monash University. So uh, please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Baudak. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Queen, for a beautiful introduction. I'm aware we have, I have only 40 minutes to deliver this talk, so I'll speak a little faster than usual. I hope you don't mind. Um, this is a very controversial topic. The convention, TSO quarterly, we're talking about areas in a, in a panel discussion, areas in TSO that has been under-researched, and he mentioned silent as one of them. So silent is a seriously under-researched area that would need more um, um, contribution from everybody. This is a very um, controversial topic because if you ask people, say there are 200 people in this room and if, if I ask you what silent means to you, I'm sure I will have 200 different answers and I've tried this everywhere. Now, um, two examples I could give straight away. Some, Sometimes you hear people say, if... Um, if you don't know enough, uh, silent is the best way to save your face. Yeah, they say that. Or sometimes they say, if silent is comfortable between two people, you know you found true love. So be very careful if you sit next to someone and you don't talk. You've got my warning, yeah? Okay, so people ask me, when did you start researching silence? And I answer, and this answer is very funny. I started looking into silence when I was a child. Now, here goes the story. Uh, people say silence better than talking trash. And like I said, silence between two people. Pagoda, you're right. <laughs> so,
outside. And so I was not behaving the way they wanted me to. This was one of my teachers saying, you open your mouth and speak. Otherwise, I will make sure you will never pass and never graduate. So I tried. It was a long journey. Imagine after years of training, pagoda to be quiet. Now I started a long journey going back to be talkative again. It, it was just suffering. Yeah? And in the end, believe it or not, I graduated. Um, my training was in Thailand. Yeah? So my first job as an English teacher was in Thailand, where I taught in um, um, Assumption University for three years. But then I thought, what's wrong with me? What has been happening to my life? Why do people keep condition me, conditioning me as a person who was open and social? I was forced to be quiet and angry. And as a person who was quiet and angry, I was forced to be a talkative person again. Why can't we be ourselves? I keep asking me this question, and that was one of the first starting points. When I think about trying to understand silence, and um, that was my first job, and that was my student in Thailand. My students, again, were very, very quiet. No matter how hard I tried to open their mouth, they wouldn't. And so I thought, something wrong with these students. Yeah, they, 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 they were troublesome as me in a different way. And, and I tried to, because I, I talked to them, they couldn't answer. And then I thought, maybe you don't know enough English. So what about, why, why don't I learn Thai? So I started to try and learn Thai to teach English using Thai. And believe it or not, I failed because after years of English language learning, they, my students still could not speak English, except me, my Thai keep improving. And so I keep feeling guilty until now. Um, and I kept thinking about this topic. I was lucky to have parents who understood me. So they said, son, you do whatever you like, don't worry. As long as you have pa passion, you follow your dream. And I thought, yeah, I need to follow my dream. But I don't know how to research silent. It was so difficult. If you research talk, you can record data, you can analyze, you have strip, you have things to look at. But if you research silent, you look at people's eyes, they say nothing. Very hard, mysterious. And so the first time I started to research silent was when I went to my university in the UK in Leeds, which is in the northern part, northern part of England. And I, I was lucky to, met, to meet a person, he's, he's very famous. Um, some of you might have read his work. His name is Brian Tomlinson. And he researched curriculum. Uh, he researched inner voice which is something going on in people's head when they don't talk. And he supervised my thesis. So I started my journey going back to my hometown, which is Ho Chi Minh City. And I started to look at students who were more similar to me who were in university, but they were very silent. In every classroom, I went to 15 different classrooms. In every class, I always saw a few students who never talk. So I thought, oh, you are interesting people, You're similar to me. I interview you, so I interview about um, 30 people and conducted a survey on 243 people. And then I got the picture of how and why people were silent. Uh, I will share with you very quickly. They, um, students um, blame culture, they say. It is the culture, it is Vietnamese traditional culture that students who are considered well-behaved should keep quiet and listen to the teacher more than anything. Um, they also said the policy of the university, we don't have time for interaction, but the policy requires us to cover the curriculum and so on and so forth. So most of students will connect their silence with the system. And by system, I mean national culture, local culture, classroom um, habits, um, and policy and curriculum. I finished my, um, my thesis with a PhD degree. But when I read my thesis again, I was not proud at all. I, it was not a very good thesis. It didn't discover things that I wanted to discover. There were in my story no one who's similar to me. I want to understand myself and people who were similar to me. So I thought, mm, I don't deserve a PhD, but I want to do it again. You know, when you finish your master thesis or your PhD thesis, you're tired of it. You say, goodbye topic. I don't want you anymore. You scare me sleepless night, and so on. But for me, uh, the journey is the opposite. 
after I finished my thesis, I keep thinking about this topic. I thought, no, no, I haven't done a good job. I have to write a thesis again. And so I moved to the U.S. and it was, um, there was a scholarship from uh, University of Boston, East West Center, they gave me money. So I flew back to Vietnam and I tried to find people like me. So I ended up at, um, I think you recognize Le Hong Phong High School. So I went there and I single out 15 very quiet students in many classrooms to interview them about their silence. I asked them, are you suffering from silence? Are you happy? Do you want to be silent or do you want to talk? What governs your behavior as such? And then they told me a different story from the story I collected before from University of Social Science Humanities. They said, we are silent because of the teacher. The teacher is boring. We're silent because of the content. The content is uninteresting. We're silent because we're uninspired because the teacher rushed through the lesson without helping us uh, unpack knowledge and so on. So they no longer blame culture and the system, but they started blaming the teacher and the textbook. And I thought, wow, so interesting. The same design, when I replicate in two different contexts, um, yield two different sets of fighting. And I thought, wow, this, this topic of silence is so interesting. I don't want to give it up. I want to study more. Maybe studying silence in Vietnam is enough. I want to study silence in another culture to see if there's anything interesting. So um, 2007, I got my job at Monash University. That was arts faculty when I started working. And my most, I, th I taught third year students and most of my students are Anglo, white, Australian. And I noticed that for the first time, because people think silent come from the East. You know, if you're Asian, you're shy, you're embarrassed, you've been conditioned to be silent. In the West, people are outspoken. They participate, but here, here I was, in English, uh, in language, in, like, in many different classrooms where most of my students are white, but some of them were very quiet. So I started to study Australian silence. I asked 10 students that I picked about their silence, and they gave me some of these findings. To make a long story short, in Australian students' view, they said, someone who is talkative in their first language can become easily silent. In another language, they say language makes a difference. They also said, silence doesn't work in a vacuum. Silence is not a matter of personality. Silence is a matter of interaction with a lot of factors in the education setting. For example, culture, relationship with peers, own personality, mood of the day, uh, brain or shy will affect the way you talk or not. The content of the lesson, receptivity of the teacher when the teacher invites you to speak, Teacher behavior in response to you will decide whether you are inspired enough to talk more or whether you should withdraw into yourself and keep silent. The inspiration of the atmosphere and the degree of challenge in the lesson, all of these factors affect how much students want to talk or keep silent. So again, uh, it's a different set of... If the, in the first um, research of mine, it was system. Yeah, silent came from the system. The second one, silent came from the teacher and the content. This one, silent came from the environment. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting. I want to travel if, I, will, if I, I live long enough. Yeah, I wish I had many lives to travel around the world and study silent in every country. Because I thought maybe if I go to another country, silent will give me a different shade and color. So I continue. Now, back then, when I, you would read into the literature uh, about silence, mostly Western scholars will tell you that silence comes from Asia. If you are from Vietnam, Indonesia, China, Japan, and so on, you are conditioned to be quiet. If you're Western, you're not. And they blame silence on um, traditional culture, especially Confucianism. So Western scholars look into um, you know, um, a Confucian discourse and say, Confucian taught Asian people to shut up for good behavior. If you are silent, you're saving face. If you're silent, you consider well manner. But that is not true. I went back to the inner analects written by Confucian, Confucius. And I, I worked with a, a team of um, East Asian people reading 
the original version of the Analyte, and I found something very different from Western scholars saying, and I will share with you very quickly. Um, Western scholars say, silent is saving face. Western scholars say, silent is better than talk. But when we read into the Analyte, Confucius said something very different. They said, Silence doesn't work alone. Action must precede word, words. Whether you are talking or not talking, that's not important, but you must prove yourself with action, not talk. Um, I, would, I highlight a few things in red, so you just focus on them for me for the moment. Um, when you talk, your talk must carry weight. It must have authority. It must be validated by knowledge and action. And so Confucius said, it's very important not to, be, to listen before talking. Silence is not everything. You must listen, then you talk. So before you talk, there's silence. But silence doesn't stand alone. Um, it's important to refrain from unqualified speech. And that refrain moment is called silence. But it doesn't mean you're silent forever. You will have to speak after the action. Um, speech appropriacy is more important than speech and more important than silence. That's what Confucius said. Now, going back to Western discourse, people say silence is practiced to save faith. Confucius say no, silence does not save faith. So what says faith then? He said, well validated speech save faith. At first you're silent, preparing to save faith. But if you keep silent forever, you lose faith. You have to talk in a meaningful way. Yeah, so the, the waiting might save your face, yeah. Um, if you are curious, you might take a, a shot of these. These are valuable articles um, that um, analyze Confucius teaching very clearly, and it will say things that Western discourse have missed out upon. I will move on to the next um, research. Yes, yeah, so far I've conducted two research on silence Vietnam, one um, research on Australian silence, now, my fourth project was in Japan. I went to Japan and I visited high school. I asked people in a survey, what does silence mean to you? But no one can answer because children were brought up in silence. So they could not answer. I failed the first project and I conducted another project again. Eventually, I found out that in Japanese students' view, everyone has a dual responsibility. Uh, toward their own learning and toward the learning of their community. How does this work? It works this way. Talk hurts. Between silence and talk, if they're not sure whether they should talk or keep quiet, they choose to be quiet because they believe that if they talk inappropriately, it hurts people. Now, I, uh, recently I conducted another research on silence in India, in uh, Hyderabad, India. And I asked uh, Indian students the same thing. If you're not sure whether you should talk or keep silent, which one do you go for? They said, I will, I will talk. Why? They said, because silence hurts. So you see, silence is a very, very deeply rooted cultural thing um, connected to people's history. They said, Japanese students said, listening is making a connection. Silence allows an internal dialogue. So, yep. Next research project in Wuhan, China. I think everyone by now uh, is aware what, where Wuhan is, yeah? That, that's where, that's the reason for us to stay at home for, for two years. But the Wuhan is a beautiful city. It's the second biggest um, country, uh, city in, in the whole China in terms of number of universities. It's a very intellectual city and I went there and I conducted um, a survey on 125 students interviewing 10 people. And I collect among some of my findings, I collect this very interesting story that Chinese students told me. Once upon a time, there was a flea trapped in a bottle. Every day the flea tried so hard to get out, but it couldn't. Why? Because on top of the bottle, there was a lid. However, one day, when the lid is removed, was removed, 
the flea continued to stay in the bottle. What was wrong with the flea? Maybe habit. Yes, habit. Now the lid is in the mind of the flea. Yeah. So they told me this story. And here are some of, I will go back to the story and explain what it means in education. Students said there was a gap between expectation in high school and in university. In high school, students were expected to be quiet. Um, being quiet in the classroom is, was considered good behavior in secondary setting. However, when students moved to university, lecturers told them that, no, no, you can't be quiet anymore. It's about time to talk. However, seven years in high school, they stopped talking for, long t for so long that it becomes very hard now to break the routine. Um, so going back to the same story, the flea is Chinese student. The bottle is silence, expectation in high school. The lid is expectation, uh, yes, in high school. And then one day that expectation is gone when students move on to university. However, students continue to keep their reluctance to break silence because silence now is in their heart. Very hard to change. My next project was in Korea. You see, the project in Japan talk about the internal dialogue, um, the duality of responsibility between um, one's learning and between the learning of others. Silent help, both. Yeah. In Korea, there was strong resistance when students are silent. I will keep uh, it short by just showing you jumping to um, the main finding of the Korean project. They said, silent is resistance. Is a form of resistance against what? Maybe against many things, against teacher style, against the content which is not um, inspiring, against the policy. Silent allow moni monitoring words inside the mind before, before people speak. Silent is incubation of ability for future communication. After this project, I went back to Monash University, and I thought, previously I conducted two projects on Vietnamese silence, um, on especially people in Vietnam who have not had the experience learning overseas. This time, I decided to find silent Vietnamese students who live in Australia for a long time, those who have had the experience interacting with Western students to see what they think about silence now, if they are silent, and so I've got a different set of um, findings. They say silent is a choice. When we are silent, we're not suffering. We decide to be silent for a reason. So they are absolutely in control of their silent moment. They say silent can help enhance the quality of talk. Silent is thinking. Silent is talking in the mind. And they discover different kinds of silent and told me. Silent can be inner speech. When you're talking inside your mind, you are practicing inner speech. And then sometimes you whisper to the person next to you that nobody else can hear. That's called private speech. And there's another kind of silence, which is um, a whispering to yourself and then whispering to the next person. It's called insider speech. Now, that project allowed me to come up with a few conclusive comments on the relationship between talk and silence for the first time. I started to see silence and talk as very similar, believe it or not. Both silence and talk can be positive or they can be negative. How? Give you some examples. They say good talk will keep conversation going between two people and good silence will leave space for each other to discuss more things. If two people keep talking, that's not good at all. And then, talk is only good when it makes sense because some people talk but say nothing. Yeah. Just like sometimes we listen but hear nothing. We look but see nothing. Very, very similar. Um, talk is only good when it makes sense. Silence is only good when it allows mental processing. Using silence and talk meaningfully. Too much talk. Dominate class time, I'm sure you've experienced classmates who keep talking and never let the teacher teach, yeah? 
So, too much talk, dominate last time, and turn people off. Too much silence restrict mutual learning. If two people keep silent forever, they may be in love, but they're not, they're not helping each other learn anything. So these are some of my conclusions based on that project on Vietnamese um, students at Monash University. Um, I'm coming to a um, conclusive comments. I learned that silence is not independent from talk. Silence is part of talk, just like music. Sometimes you pause for a second in a song just to attract listeners. Silence is a part of talk. Silence has the same function as talk. If you use talk to negotiate, to mediate, to um, respond, silence does exactly the same thing, exactly the same set of functions, communicative functions. Um, I reflect all of these projects in life and I notice that Silent and talk have hierarchy in some culture like uh, the American culture. You know, talk is more valuable than silent. If you're silent too much, you seem to suffer from inferiority complex. In some other culture like Japanese culture, if you talk too much, you turn people off. So there was a movie that represent both cultures, Western and East Asian culture. Um, this is a movie that I strongly recommend. It's so interesting a TV series by BBC um, working in conjunction with Japanese TV. It's called du Duty and Shame, Rigi, uh, Jiri and Haji. And in the movie, this, um, the plot is very interesting. There were criminals in London, and some of the criminals happened to be Japanese. So um, London police would like to have Japanese detectives imported from Japan to kind of find out the activities of the um, Yakuza or, or gangsters in, in London because they don't speak English. So they send this detective, his name is Kenzo. And in London, um, English police um, ask this Irish lady named Sarah to work um, side by side with Kenzo to, to find out what happened. And so there was a scene, which is my favorite scene in the movie, where Kenzo and Sarah were sitting down together in a cafe talking about each other's family when they first met. So questions like, um, do you have a family? How many children do you have? They talked like friends for a while. And suddenly, for, for a few seconds, there was nothing to say. And so they both keep very quiet. And Sarah began to feel very uncomfortable. She broke the silence by saying, do you have any scar? What does scar have to do with this conversation? But Kenzo answered anyway. He said, I've got one on my arm, but why do you want to know? To which Sarah answered, I'm not sure why. I just feel the need to fill in the silence between us. So she talked meaninglessly. And Kenzo said, Kenzo said, why are you not comfortable with silence? To which Sarah could not answer. She thought for a moment and she could not explain why. Then Kenzo made a suggestion. He said, how about you and I keep silent for the next 20 seconds and see how we feel. Silence not that bad. Just relax. Just don't talk. Keep silent. See how it go. Because he wanted to teach Sarah the Japanese cultural behavior. Sometimes people just keep silent at the right time for the right reason. And so Sarah agreed and she kept silent. Both of them kept silent for like around 12 seconds. And then Sarah said, at first, she was uncomfortable, and then slowly she felt, okay, if he accepts my silence, that's not too bad. And in the end, she said, okay, so what? He said, Kenzo said, you're doing very well, yeah, learning another culture. So what I'm trying to say is there no, should not be hierarchy between silent speech, but it varies. The hierarchy will vary from one culture to another, and such mismatch in understanding of values between silent and talk is extremely common in education. Uh, recently, I, had, I conducted another project in Japan, and I learned that there are expat teachers in Japan, and they are very comfortable with Japanese students silent. But my colleague and I interviewed Japanese students, and they said something like this. First of all, the teacher, like a uh, Western teacher in Japan said, students silent make us very tired. But the Japanese students said, 
Teacher talk make us very tired. Teacher talk too much. And so you see, this is where cultural values clash, and it involves silence and talk. We learn that there is no universally desirable amount of speech and silence existing in all contexts. But we need to kind of understand silence by considering its meaning as situated in a cultural context. Without that understanding, we will not understand silence. So silence remains a highly debatable construct. And this is the last story I want to share with you. Um, again, when I first came to Australia, I was teaching um, with another lecturer. Sometimes it's very common for two lecturers to appear in the same class teaching. That time in the classroom, we had about 30 people. Half the class were Anglo white Australian students. The other half was East Asian students. And we noticed that the um, Australian half were very talkative people. The Asian half were very silent people. And for me, it's okay, I'm used to both, but my, my colleague, her name is Zen Maria. She was very uncomfortable on the way out of classroom. She said that, do you notice anything? I said, what? The class is funny, how? She said, half the class talk and half the class never talk. How do you resolve this issue? I said, fine, no, don't need to resolve anything. But she said, no, 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 we need to fix this. We need to redistribute um, talking turns across the classroom, otherwise I, I will quit. I can't teach this class. I said, so what do you suggest? And so we had a long conversation in a cafe, and Jane had this interesting idea. She, uh, you know, in coffee shop, you have stirrer, coffee stirrer, and she picked a bunch of stirrer from the coffee shop and said, okay, look what I will do next time. So she brought a bunch of coffee stirrer to the classroom as she showed them to the student, distributing them three pieces to every student and said, now these are your participation sticks. Every time you open your mouth and talk, you must return one stick to us. And by the end of the lesson, everyone must get rid of your stick, otherwise you are not allowed to go home. Yeah. So that works very, very well. You know. For the first few seconds, Australian people, as usual, open their mouth and start talking, and they talk so often and so fast that it went bang, 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 on the stick will return to the teachers. And for the rest of the lesson, they sit there looking very angry. Now, the Asian students slowly contribute throughout the lesson, and they slowly return the stick. At the end, all the students talk, and all the sticks were returned. And then, on the way out, were very happy. She said, see, I fixed the problem. I said, are you sure? So I went back to class, and I conducted a survey. I said, are you happy? with the way we redistribute your talk? No. Okay, so here are what students put in the survey. They felt distress and pressure. They, don't, they didn't feel good. They feel emotional, emotionally unstable. They felt classroom process was stressful against people's personality. There is a tension between the rules that we set and the student's real need, how they learn. And then, a lot of burnings idea are not shared because students got rid of all sticks already. And some of the contributions are not really necessary. But they talk for the sake of talking. They fabricate anything just to get rid of the stick to go home. Yeah. So the learning process is not real. Participation happens not by choice but by force. And in the end, we learn this lesson. The approach that we use makes teachers very happy but makes students very angry. So this is a complex um, research that we conduct within a day. But it taught us a very valuable lesson that um, silent and talk belong to different styles of learning. And we cannot force one group to follow the other group styles. That's not fair. Yeah. And so with that, on that note, I would like to conclude my discussion. But if you wish to learn more about silent study, this is an emerging field. There, there's a um, journal that my college and I in Australia established this journal in 2021, two years ago. We, ha we have had four issues already, and they are open access and free for everyone. You just type um, Journal of Silent Study in Education, and you can read a lot of articles coming from Europe, um, Japan, mostly Europe, and um, other parts of Asia, and including Australia. Um, if you are interested to learn more about the project that I just shared with you because they are very brief summary. If you want to read for more detail, there are some books. Uh, the first one is 
Understanding Silent and Reticence, 2014. And then there's another book about a um, silence in East Asia, yeah. um, published, I think, two years ago. And this book just came out two months ago. It's called Silent in Pedagogy. After understanding silence among students, how do you use that silence in the way you teach? It was written in this book, so these are um, some of the um, recent um, research projects in books that I'd like to recommend to you. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for your engagement. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you very much for, you know, like a very um, insightful right? uh, <clears throat> issue about uh, silence in the classroom. And we have some minutes for uh, Q&A. So, uh, yeah, I hope uh, we practice this one, silence. <laughs> oh, we share house. <laughs> Practice silence, or you practice. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your very engaging presentation. I have uh, two questions. And the first question, you um, talk a lot about talk, but my question is uh, regarding to talk and writing, and. Um, in what extent do you agree that a free uh, section of writing or a discussion uh, just with images and words in silence conductive or beneficial to students' learning? Um, to be general, um, in what extent do you agree um, that mindful silence beneficial to students' learning? And the second question, um, it can be about teachers. Um, in what ways that teachers can maximize, can maximize um, the learning opportunities for both teachers and students just in silence? Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much for your question. Now the first question, how do we make mindful, mindful silence beneficial to learning? Uh, we cannot just, a lot of teachers say, if my students are silent, I will respect their silence. You can just continue to be silent, up to you. Those who talk, continue to talk. It's okay, I respect both of you. That's not working, yeah? You need to guide them. As much as you're guiding talk, because as a teacher, teaching students how to verbally communicate, we guide them step by step in the process of developing speech proficiency. We will do the same with silence. If we want to respect students' silence, one of the efficient way of respecting their silence is to guide their silence. You know, when you design the DVD, perhaps consider both. There are moments for speech, and there are also moments for silence. The moment speech will come with instruction. How should you talk? Who do you talk with? And when do we listen to you? The same applies to silence. You will have five minutes or ten minutes of silence here and there. What do you do in that minute? And then after that, what do I expect from you, from your silence, as the outcome of silence? So talk must have an outcome, and silence must have an outcome as a proficient teacher being confronted by both children's desire to speak and their habitual silence. We might like to give instruction for both. Yeah. Once silence and talk both are guided, uh, efficient learning is likely to happen. Answering your first question. Now, your second question is how both teacher and student use silence together. Silence happens in learning when students process meaning, when they talk inside their head, when they incubate idea or build proficiency over the time. So, on the side of learning, silence slowly help learning. Um, on the side of pedagogy, teachers sometimes are found in research to talk too much. Sometimes when students need silent time to process information, to think, to solve problems. But the teacher tried to fill in that silent time with meaningless talking. Yeah. You, if you observe many classrooms, you notice that sometimes students sit there and try to think. But the teacher interrupts their silence by saying trash, you know, like, so how do you feel? What do you do? What are you doing? Can you do this? And they repeat instruction. 
and they keep talking rubbish. And students were very angry. And this came from research at Van Lang University. Um, I don't know if you know, um, one of my colleagues is uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Phạm Vũ Phi Hồ. Yeah. He was with me um, interviewing students at Van Lang University, and we discovered that about 50% of teacher talk is useless. And on many occasions, students quietly wish that this teacher please shut up for us to learn. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, to your second question, I would say, yes, silence is useful, not just for learning, but also for teaching. And we must understand how learning happens in silence as much as how the silent space in teachers' pedagogy will allow students to grow by themselves. Yeah. I hope I answer your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Together with this one, you know, we often hear topics like teachers talk or uh, willingness to communicate in the classroom, right? Yeah, I hope you have heard of that. And then uh, we add one more uh, to the, you know, the field of research and uh, that, that, we, that we can explore and make the most uh, in our classrooms, okay? So thank you very thank much, you very uh, much. Dr. Baudet. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dai Bao, for your insightful speech. And now we would like Dr. Nguyen Thinga to get to the stage to present the flowers and certificate of appreciation to Dr. Dai Bao. Please welcome Dr. Dai Bao and Dr. Nguyen Thinga on the stage. <laughs> 